For 100 days, Israel's war on Gaza has gone on unabated, a massacre of Palestinians in full view of the world. Israel has failed to meet its stated objectives and carries on. So what will end the suffering? Or is the real goal the ethnic cleansing of Gaza? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. It's been 100 days since Israel began its devastating assault on Gaza. Three months of death, destruction and forced displacement, backed by Western powers and Western weapons. The worst conflict since the 1948 Nakba, which saw the expulsion of more than 750,000 Palestinians from their land. South Africa's genocide case against Israel at the International Court of Justice has revealed a divided world. So how can this misery inflicted on the Palestinian people be stopped? Has Israel itself been damaged by this war? And could international reaction help Palestinians in the long run? We'll put those questions to our guests in just a moment. But first, this report from Uma Kulsum Sharif. In 100 days, lives have turned upside down. From a home in northern Jabalia to being displaced in southern Gaza. Ibrahim Asif's family has dodged Israeli airstrikes, ground attacks and lost loved ones. They're now battling a bitter winter cold, living in this shanty made with plastic sheeting. I have a small tent. The cold has killed us. There's no food. There's nothing. I can't give my children a carton of milk. My children are sick. They won't even give us any material for our tents. The UN says 1.9 million Palestinians, that's 85% of Gaza's population, have been displaced in Israel's war on Gaza. The Israeli military forced Palestinians in the north to move south after designating it a so-called safe place. It then began bombing southern cities, the last place of refuge for families displaced several times. There's little food, water and medicine for a population that was dependent on humanitarian aid even before the war began. Where will we go when we return to Gaza City? Where are we going to stay? All of our homes, markets, universities, organizations are destroyed. Everything we have is here. Without Gaza, we don't have lives. If we go back to Gaza City, we will put up a tent. Is it our destiny to be displaced? Displaced in 1948 and now again in 2024? Israel began what it calls a military operation in Gaza after a Hamas attack on October 7th that killed about 1,200 people. Since then, Israel has relentlessly targeted every part of Gaza, one of the most densely populated places on earth. It's also restricted humanitarian aid to the Strip as UN agencies are warning of famine and disease. A tragic, catastrophic, indescribable situation. Everyone saw thousands of dead and wounded. Those who were not killed were wounded. Those who were not wounded had their homes destroyed. Those who did not lose their homes were displaced. A disaster that has struck all Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Nearly 24,000 Palestinians have been killed, with the majority of women and children among the dead. Israel's longest, bloodiest and most destructive war in Gaza's history has led to global demonstrations calling for an immediate ceasefire. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he will continue his war. Umikulsum Sharif for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From Ramallah, we're joined by Hanan Ashrawi, a Palestinian political leader and former member of the Palestine Liberation Organization Executive Committee. She was also a member of the Palestinian delegation to the Middle East peace talks in the early 1990s. From London, we're joined by Dr. Omar Abdelmanan, a pediatric neurologist and co-founder of At Gaza Medic Voices and head of UK operations for Fajr Scientific, 
a non-profit organization which sends surgeons to Gaza and the occupied West Bank. And from Tel Aviv, we're joined by Gideon Levy, a columnist at the Haaretz newspaper and author of The Punishment of Gaza. A warm welcome to you all. Uh, Dr. Ashwari, let's uh, start with you first. I want to get your, your thoughts on this terrible anniversary, 100 days since Israel began its devastating assault on Gaza. Do you see this ending anytime soon? Uh, from all indications, there is a clear determination to persist, to continue, to continue with the mass slaughter, taking different ways without any kind of accountability, without any kind of restraints or constraints. And this is extremely dangerous because uh, Netanyahu himself every day stands up and declares that he will pursue this war. The war must go on and he will achieve his ends. Now his ends are unachievable and this war is waged against innocent civilians, against uh, 2.3 million Palestinians who are entirely defenseless. And uh, unfortunately, the impunity that Israel has enjoyed all these decades, not just years, is now coming into play because he feels, and of course his cabinet, and, and I think the Israelis in general, began to feel that they are not only invincible, but untouchable in terms of being subject to a global rule of law. So they are used to this pattern where they can do what they want, get away with it, and they can treat the rest of the world with total disdain, whether it is multilateral organizations or the International Court of Justice or anything else, including the, the uh, U.S. That, that has given Israel everything it wanted and more in order to pursue this uh, slaughter, uh, this genocide. So I think so far there are no clear indications that there will be any kind of sense or humanity or decency even in the war machine that is Israel. And it still remains to be seen whether the international community will develop the backbone and the will to certainly not just hold Israel to account, but to take measures to show Israel that there is a price to be paid. There are consequences to be made if uh, Israel pursues this. Let's bring in Gideon Levy then in, uh, uh, the, in Tel Aviv. Uh, uh, Gideon, uh, how much longer do you think this war is going to go on? Israel has not ach achieved its objectives. Does it stand any realistic chance of doing so? I thought from day one that those goals are very vague and basically unachievable. Mainly this notion of uh, trashing Hamas was from the beginning an unachievable goal, and now it's proven that it's unachievable but after three months of tens of thousands of Israeli soldiers within the Gaza Strip, killing and destructing everything, and the goal doesn't seem even to get closer to that. Now, how long will it last? First of all, we have to ask Washington, how long will it let it last? Because by the end of the day, as, as was mentioned already by now, the United States gave a green light for this war, and we should always remember it, with all those niceties and lip services about trying to avoid the uh, uh, casualties among uh, the civilian society and so forth. By the end of the day, they are arming it, they are financing it, and they are encouraging it, and we should remember it. Now, once uh, the United States will, stay, will say, enough is enough, don't, and then Israel will have to stop. But what does it mean Israel will stop? Israel is not going to pull out from Gaza. And then it can last for months and, God forbid, maybe for years of Israeli presence there with resistance, because you don't expect the people of Gaza to welcome those who kill the, their beloved ones and destruct their land. So we might face a very, very long campaign, namely because nobody has the slightest idea what should be the end game. Dr. Abdel Manan, um, tell us about the, the, the impact this is having on, on kids in, the, in Gaza, uh, both psychologically and physically. I think the first thing to say is that uh, we have surpassed the 100, 100 days of this escalation and bombardment of uh, Gaza. And it has resulted in at least 9,000 children being killed and thousands more under the rubble. There are numerous thousands of orphan children that are wounded with no surviving family members. My own colleagues who have just come out of uh, Gaza in the last few days, these are doctors, who British doctors who have gone in with the WHO to help at our AXA hospital. What they described to us having come back is 
an apocalyptic situation in the emergency department, way beyond, way worse than anything we are even seeing on Al Jazeera or other uh, news outlets in the Arab world. And that is terrifying. They have described children coming in with bilateral above the knee amputations as a result of explosive devices or shrapnel injuries. Um, one of my colleagues was telling me how on his last day, just before they left, he was treating a child in the emergency department, a three-year-old child with his bowels exposed from a shrapnel injury. And when he looked up, he saw next to him another child, a sibling, a sister, who had a traumatic brain injury. And next to her was her cousin, who had died on the floor from another blast injury. This is the reality. This is a war on children, but it's not a war because it is a genocidal attack that is exterminating children, women, and men in Gaza. In terms of the psychological effects, it is too acute right now to know what the long-term effects will be. But what I can tell you, and this is coming from the mouths of the doctors who have just come out, is that every single person inside Gaza has been psychologically traumatized, has su is suffering from mental health disorders in the form of depression and anxiety, at the very least, if not PTSD. But actually, it is not post-traumatic stress disorder. It is intra-attack uh, stress disorder, because the attacks is happening as we speak. These children are coming in emotionally blunt, completely shaking, completely unable to speak, because they have just woken up to find rubble on their face. Their house is destroyed, their family members lying dead next to them. Some have been under the rubble for days and then rescued miraculously. These effects will lead to an epidemic of psychological and psychiatric mental health disorders in these children who will grow up disillusioned and disgusted by what has happened to their own family who have been wiped out, generations gone. And this is what the West and the Western leaders who are complicit in this by allowing Israel to continue at large will have to suffer and they will have to deal with this because this will have a long-term geopolitical effect on the Western world, on Europe, on America. But unfortunately, they are too short-sighted to see this for their own benefit even. Dr. Ashrawi, what do you make of what, what you heard yeah. there? We said in the introduction that this was the worst conflict since the 1948 Nakba. Uh, is what we're seeing now the worst catastrophe to, fall, to befall Palestinians? Yes, certainly, but it is part of a pattern. First of all, as uh, he said, this is not a conflict at all. This is a deliberate uh, policy of subjugation, of uh, what would you call it, a, a policy of inflicting pain willfully, of uh, death and destruction, uh, and it's been ongoing. The Nakba, when we talk about the Nakba in '48. Even that, it may have been a, a, a very decisive moment in our history, and it's been traumatic for all of us, our parents and grandparents. Uh, and, and it has continued. It has continued in fits and starts and stages, but it certainly has continued as an implementation of uh, a basic, basic Zionist policy of displacement, replacement of apartheid, of uh, replacing all of... Uh, uh, historical Palestine with greater Israel, and of course, giving itself the right to act with impunity and to persist without any kind of intervention. Now, uh, this has taken matters, this latest uh, uh, relentless, ruthless, and human and cruel assault has turned Gaza into a slaughterhouse, literally, uh, and, and of course, filled with destruction of homes and infrastructure, anything that makes life livable. And it's a deliberate policy. That's why it is so cruel, so inhuman, so hateful, so vicious, that it is deliberately trying not just to destroy human life now, but to destroy the future. Uh, there is no reason. I mean, they started with the universities and the schools and the hospitals and everything in order to deprive the Palestinians of Gaza of, of from a future, a future that they badly need. But in this case, coming in the aftermath of years of siege, of years of deprivation, and, of course, every few years of, of uh, uh, assaults from the sky and, and so on. So now, it seems to me, this matters have come to a head. The, the sense that Israel is not only invincible but unaccountable. 
that it can do whatever it wants to a captive people. This bubble in which the Israelis have been living, trying to normalize a most vicious and cruel occupation, trying to normalize holding a whole nation captive okay. and bashing it uh, daily. Yeah. This is not normal. Yeah. And the fact that people are reacting now, Palestinians have reacted, mm. and the Israelis who have been living in this bubble, in this make-believe world, have suddenly said, we are the victims after all. Okay. And this kind of self, the, the, the whole use of self-defense and we are the victims and so on, is no longer applicable because okay. the ICJ, because of uh, South Africa and, and some other uh, courageous countries have laid bare Israel's uh, horrendous violence. And Israel itself has gone way beyond the pale, beyond anything that is in any way recognized. By, by human minds and arts. Dr. Ashwari, you make a couple of points that I want to put to, to, to Gideon Levy. Uh, first of all, uh, we talked about the, the aims of the war, Israel's war not being meant, namely the, the freeing of, of all captives and the destruction of Hamas. But are its real aims about killing as many Palestinians as possible with international political cover from the US and, and, and mm -hmm. ethnically cleansing Gaza? It's very hard to put the point. I mean, I'm listening to my friend Hanana Shrawi, and I can't agree more. Uh, what we see now is a continuous of, of a long-standing policy in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Palestine, in which, first of all, Palestinians' lives don't matter at all. And, and, and you see it. They are our interests, and if we want to crush Hamas, and we have the right to crush Hamas, we have also the right to kill as many people as we need or as many people as we wish. I don't think that the aim is killing so many civilians, but I think that killing civilians is perceived in Israel as the, something quite minor, same for the destruction. The destruction is unbelievable. I mean, I, I can't even imagine it throughout the videos and the images I see from there. From Gaza, nothing is left from Gaza. And we all loved Gaza one day. Again, for Israel, this was not the aim. This, was, this is some kind of side product, which is quite minor and unimportant, because we have our goal and we have our right. Because we believe that after the 7th of October, Israel has the right to do whatever it wants. And when I say whatever it more wants, it means whatever it wants. No moral limits, no legal limits, nothing. We can go crazy because we went through this barbaric attack. This attitude by itself is horrifying, is depressing, is obviously illegal and immoral. And I'm just thinking about the children who are witnessing all this what will come out of Gaza in 10, but, 20 years' time? Uh -huh. What does Israel think that what will be the next step of Gaza? Mm. And, and, and you remain like whistling, whistling in the darkness okay. because nobody in Israel wouldn't care less. Gideon, is, is Israel being damaged politically by this war, I mean, both internationally and internally? I mean, uh, one of the... The South African lawyers representing South, South Africa but said that this is genocide, that it's being played out live on TV and the Internet. D does that influence how the world is, is reacting to, to, to Israel now? People are coming out all over the world to demonstrate against it. I mean, it's, it's done a lot of harm, certainly in the court of public opinion, hasn't it? But what about politically? No, it doesn't even scratch Israeli public opinion because Israel throughout the years and throughout the brainwash machinery built itself or covered itself, surrounded itself with a protection wall, namely that anyone who criticizes Israel, who dares to criticize Israel, is an anti-Semite, in which, in any case, whatever Israel does, the whole world will be against us. So it's the problem of the critics and not our problem. And the fact that so many people are raising their voice against Israel just shows how bad is the world and not how bad is Israel? Israel is still having the most moral army in the world. I can assure you that 80, 90 percent of the Israelis still think so, and they all support this war. And the world, yeah, bad case, bad luck. The world is anti-Semite, 
and it doesn't has nothing to do with what we are doing. With this protection wall, nothing is scratched. Dr. Abdul Manan, 70% of buildings and homes have been either completely destroyed or severely damaged, according to the UN. The humanitarian situation is dire. Water, electricity, sanitation services have been destroyed. Will, will Gaza ever be habitable again? And, and, and if it will be, I mean, who, who pays for the reconstruction? I think the short answer, and this is speaking to uh, the civilians in Gaza, the doctors, the same doctors I mentioned who came out, one of them is Palestinian British. He was having conversations with people on the ground and overhearing conversations between patients and relatives inside Al-Aqsa and other hospitals. And what he took away from it was that people in Gaza themselves do not think they will remain there. They have reached a, le a level, unfortunately, of depression where they are convinced the world has given up on them, that humanity has given up on them, that they've be they have been dehumanized to the point that the only solution is that they will be either forced out or they will be forced to die in their very shelters and their very homes. And, you know, Palestinians, as Dr. Ashrawi will know, are the most resilient people, you know, I have come across in Gaza especially. These are people who are steadfast. They have sumud. They are able to resist occupation for 75 years and, and resist it well. And yet this situation is on a scale that is un incomprehensible. I honestly think this will take decades of rebuilding. I have been talking about the day after, but what if the day after never comes? What if the day after is the complete annihilation of Gaza live on our TV screens and there is nowhere for them to go back to? They are displaced in the Sinai, in Jordan, across the Middle East, in Europe. These same Palestinians will end up having to be forced and evacuated to other countries. And this is unacceptable, but to me and to anyone who's been watching the news, there is no other clear incentive, you know, there is no other clear direction of travel. But this, the Israelis have reoccupied Gaza. They know this land is fertile. They know this land is crucial for them financially. And in terms of the water systems, we know that this century was going to lead to humongous constraints in terms of water scarcity and water wars. This was a direction of travel. It is interesting that weeks before the 7th of October, mm. Netanyahu was facing one of the largest anti-government demonstrations in the history of Israel. And his government, this warmongering government, is the most far-right extreme government that has taken over Israel since okay. its inception, probably. Yeah. Um, and and, and, and this, is, this is a situation that will need the West to pay. It right. will need many other countries to rebuild. OK, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you short, but we're running out of time here. Hanan Hashrawi, Hashrawi this uh, war differs from others where a huge number of civilians are under attack and it's being documented live and filmed and disseminated yes. online by brave Palestinian journalists. The world can see what is happening. Could the Palestinian cause, do you think, ultimately be helped uh, by this war uh, due to the upsurge in, in awakening in people around the world uh, as, as seen by the, the huge demonstrations that we saw over the weekend. Yes, exactly. The, human, the huge demonstrations we're talking about are coming about as a result of a public awareness, as a result of exposure to what is happening, uh, as a result of social media, perhaps, and the widening of the movement of solidarity and people of conscience who just watched in horror and couldn't stand idly by and see that their own governments are complicit in this. Yes, there is a rising awareness, but is it enough and is it in, in time? That's the issue because governments like the US, like the UK, like Germany, like France, countries are rushing to, to justify Israel's genocide. Germany, for heaven's sake, is attempting to be complicit in another genocide uh, by supporting Israel's genocide rather than uh, taking a position saying, no more uh, genocides. Uh, and, and this, the, the Palestinians and the world cannot understand. Biden, Blinken, uh, all these guys are, are out there, not just justifying it, but supplying them with weapons and, and with money and buying time for them and vetoing resolutions. That, that's the problem. I mean, we know that there will be a time lag between public opinion and between uh, uh, government decisions, but also there is a very clear sense of cynical, manipulative self-interest, particularly in the U.S., 
And, and uh, that is, of course, the issue of financing, there's the issue of funding, there's the issue of uh, their own uh, uh, economic interests and the military industrial complex and the India, Middle East, uh, Europe okay. road and all these things okay. in, in terms of attempting to justify, no, attempting to justify another neo-colonial assault on a region and on a people right. that have been victimized so long. Is the standing of the U.S., which still sees itself as the leader of the world, been damaged by its support for Israel over this conflict? And how about the EU standing as a champion of democracy and human rights? How has that been affected by its support for Israel among major members like Germany, uh, which is opposing South Africa's application to the ICJ? First of all, uh, the EU is a pale shade of the United States. And as it concerns the Middle East, it never had a real independent uh, attitude. I don't know why I can't see any explanation, but the fact is that they are just a pale echo of the American policy. And the Americans have now an ele election year. Biden tried his best. I think his intentions are good. I am not one of those who think that his intentions are bad. But really, to let this go, to give this enormous aid without any conditions, at least put some conditions, at least keep the, the, the American interests, because he says one thing, and Israel is doing the opposite, and he continues to put the veto one time after the other in the Security Council, and to yeah. finance, and to send arms, and with those arms, children are being killed on a daily basis, for God's sake. Can't he okay. see it once and for all? Uh, Dr. Ashrawi, is, is there any hope at all? Of course there is hope. As you said earlier, the Palestinians are exceedingly resilient. We're not going to go anywhere. We're staying here and we're going to persist. The thing is there has to be a shift. And now the, the global south is moving. The global north has been exposed for a, a hypocritical racist uh, system that it is, neo-colonial system. And of course, Israel now has been laid bare as a fascist system that is busy committing genocide, as you said, in plain sight. So the equations and the configurations are shifting now. Okay. And all sorts of fault lines have been exposed. It's going to take time for this to play out. But nowadays, you cannot ignore the Palestinians and the Palestinian cause as a key to any kind of stability and security in the region. There is no normalization without a just solution to the Palestinian cause. There is no longer the ability to ignore and dismiss and render the Palestinians invisible. That's why there is hope. Okay. Because without us, there, there cannot be any kind of justice or peace or even a genuine test for the efficacy of the global or multilateral okay. system of justice. The, we, I'm afraid we must end it. Uh, Many thanks indeed, Hanan Ashrawi, Dr. Omar Abdel Manan, and Gideon Levy uh, for being with us on the program today. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again at any time by going to the website of aljazeera.com. For further discussion, you can join us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on X. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha, we'll see you again. Bye for now.